was going to come hand that newcomer so a program, sweet. and I was like, oh, wait, she's not a newcomer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right, that's right. People still talk about your forums. Oh, what? Forums. Oh, that old oh. process, yeah. familiar with the Stanford yeah. Talisman group? I've heard. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I love John. And they, he's done several of these songs. Oh, yeah. Periodically, they put out a CD or something.
Good morning. I'm Linda Randolph. I'm a member of the board, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the board of directors, uh, wherever you're from, whoever you are, and wherever you are on your journey. If you want more information about TBUUC, there's a card in the back of the seat in front of you or the pew in front of you. You can fill that out and drop it in the collection plate. Um, the CDC has ranked Knox County as low risk, which means that masks nor vaccinations are required in indoor spaces. Uh, the full policy is access through the TVUUC website. The Lizzie Crozier French Room is for those who feel more comfortable if they and others have masks on. Room A is for families with children, all of whom are supposed to be masked except those over under two years old, two years and old and under. Uh, you can also watch the services online. As we move forward together, please remember that we are each other's keepers. Uh, if you or your family are interested in our lifespan and religious education program, there's a table set up right in the lobby on the way out of the sanctuary before you get to the lobby, and Miriam Davis is staff staffing that. Um, the caring table. If you would like to visit the caring table in the fellowship room, Please visit it and sign a thank you card to Jametta, since she is departing us. <clears throat> and next week, after the service in the fellowship hall, there's to be um, a congratulatory meeting. Okay. Last week, Ryan, uh, Mc, 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 Ryan, <laughs> uh, Thank you. <laughs> um, read off a number of volunteers who we were thanking for their service the previous year. The, yeah, the previous year. Um, it's hard to get everyone included. So Ken Stevenson gave me this list to please add to those thank yous. I think that was Elnora's suggestion, and it's a good one. <laughs> Um, so we thank the 8th Principal Task Force, the COVID-19 Task Force, the Lifespan and Religious Education Volunteers, the Choir, Program Council, Ushers and Greeters, Small Group Ministry, the Strategic Planning and its Task Forces, and the Worship Committee. That still doesn't include everyone. It's really amazing how much has kept going through the last two and a half years. Uh, a lot of people involved. <laughs> Today is June 19th day, too. Just wanted to mention that. Uh, now, please silence your cell phones or any other electronic devices you may have, and we'll get going. During this musical meditation, uh, if you have one of these till hymnals ham handy, you can follow along with the text at um, number 1019. Um, a portion of the refrain says, oh, you can be anybody you want to be. You can love whomever you will, and the only measure of your words and deeds will be the love you leave behind when you're done.
Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without the thunder and the lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Frederick Douglass. us power to rip down prisons, oh God give us power to lift up people, oh God give us courage to withstand hatred, oh God give us courage not to be bitter, oh God give us power and make us fear Oh God, give us power, because we need it. Be seated. I invite you to join with me in responsive reading 593, which is in the back of the gray hymnal. And these words are by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Liberation is costly. And I'll say the words in bold if you'll join me in the words in italics. Liberation is costly. Even after the Lord had delivered the Israelites from Egypt, they had to travel through the desert. They had to bear the responsibilities and difficulties of freedom. There was starvation and thirst, and they kept complaining. They complained that their diet was monotonous. Many of them preferred the days of bondage in the flesh pots of Egypt. We must remember that liberation is costly. It needs unity. We must hold hands and refuse to be divided. We must be ready. Some of us will not see the day of our liberation physically. But those people will have contributed to the struggle. Let us be united. Let us be filled with hope. Let us be those who respect one another. To introduce our joys and concerns, I'm going to ask a question. Who knows what the 
We have, our building has many different words on the front of it engraved in the stone, love, justice, peace. But who knows the first word on the building on the Kingston Pike side? If you, if you know it, say it out loud. That's right. <laughs> joy. So our joy is next week we'll be celebrating the ministry of the Reverend uh, Jametta Alston. We're going to have a big party against her will. Uh, uh, she, she assured us that she, she wanted a low-key thing, but we're going we're gonna to celebrate big time anyhow. So uh, come help us, help us do that. Um, Another joy is uh, last night, uh, some of us were out at uh, Oak Ridge Unitarian Universalist Church celebrating the uh, ministries of, of the Reverend Jake Morrill and the Reverend Tandy Scheffler who are completing their work with that congregation. Uh, both of those uh, people have origins in our congregation. Jake was a high school youth representative on the board when he was in high school, and he's not in high school anymore. And uh, uh, Tandy was uh, chair of the RE committee when I was religious education director, so it was wonderful to be out there and celebrate uh, their ministries. They were powerful people before they were ordained into the ministry, and they will be powerful people as they complete their ministry and go on to whatever is next. Another joy is that the Martin Luther King parade that was canceled uh, due to uh, uh, cold weather has been rescheduled for tomorrow, the first time this city has celebrated the official federal holiday, Juneteenth. And so uh, I still haven't figured out if we're still officially registered, but come on out and look for the church banner because we'll squeeze in with someone else. Uh, we were registered in the winter, I'm assuming it'll happen. So uh, short notice for all of us, but uh, look for the church banner and the Martin Luther King Parade. We'll meet at uh, the Midway Chill Howie uh, Park entrance, and it will end at Dr. Walter E. Hardy Park, So, which is the, the route that has been had the last couple of years, I believe. So our thoughts are, and prayers are with uh, Faye Joyce, who's returned from the hospital, and she's uh, had pneumonia. Uh, she is not up for visitors, but loves cards, including you can sign a card at the card table in the fellowship hall. Bill Dabbs, who is usually working sound magic, has lost uh, his brother-in-law, Ted Schrauer, who died this week. Bill's mother is also experiencing ill health, so the whole family is grieving and rallying to, su to support his mother in this time of loss. Uh, no one does more for our church than Bill, so let's surround him with love. There's also a card you can sign in the fellowship hall. And we are mindful of the recent uptick in COVID cases because we follow you on Facebook. And we are appreciative of those volunteers who have stepped up to fill volunteer roles as others have uh, needed to make the choice to quarantine. Knox County is still at low risk, uh, according to the CDC, but the numbers are upticking, and so everybody be careful. Everybody be careful out there. So with these joys and concerns in mind, I invite you into a Father's Day med meditation. It's called Fathering Words by Mike Johnson. So I invite you into a period of quiet meditation. Close your eyes if you wish and get comfortable in your seat. Think about the father figure you carry in your heart. I invite you to remember the gifts and the wounds you received from that person or persons. If any feelings come up, just breathe deeply and honor those feelings as a connection with your heart. Let us be silent together.
as we emerge from the silence, I invite you to listen to some fathering words that we don't get to hear often enough. I love you just the way you are. I have confidence in you, and I know you can achieve your goals. I stand behind you, and you can depend on me. I am proud of you. Stand up for yourself. Your opinions and feelings are important. I have faith in you. Let us meditate on these words for a moment of silence. ready, you can open your eyes, breathe deeply, and look at the people who love you all around you. Good morning, thank you for joining us today. My name is Claudia Presley, and I'm the Director of Finance and Operations here at TVUUC. Today is a Share the Plate Sunday. What that means is that high, what that means is that any contribution that is not a pledge will be split between our Share the Plate organization today and the General Operating Fund of TVUUC. The organization today is called Helping Mamas. They are not able to have a representative here, but they did send me information. So here's a little bit about them. The National Helping Mamas Foundation was organized in 2014. Their mission is to connect 
helping mamas to mamas needing help. There is a modern day crisis facing mothers. There is no coordinated effort to get baby supplies into the hands of many mothers who need them. Assistance programs like WIC and SNAP do not allow for the purchase of diapers, wipes, pack and plays, or car seats. The Helping Mamas branch in Knoxville was opened in November of 2018. They now work with 55 agencies in the Knoxville area. They are the only registered diaper bank within two and a half hours of Knoxville. What they do is contributions that come in, they purchase essential supplies, they then distribute them to their 55 partner agencies, and those agencies in turn can distribute them to moms and families in need. So if you feel led to contribute to them today, you can do that by placing a check or cash in the offering baskets that will be placed or that will be um, passed here in just a few minutes. You can also look in your order of service and see the ways that you can give here in the building. If you're watching us online, you can go to our website, tvuuc.org, and you can give that way. Thank you so much for joining us today and for helping this organization. We Declare Your Majesty was composed in 1984 by Malcolm Duplessis. His multilingual worship fused praise and protests in the apartheid era of his native South Africa. As an activist, he relentlessly calls for the decolonization of the worship movement and for doors of dignity to be unlocked for more communities and ethnicities through their contributions to a common hymnal. Of course, any organization that provides diapers and other needs is not just helping mamas, helping dads and every other kind of parenting beyond the binary. This morning I want to talk about the anti-apartheid theology of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, but before I do I want to assure any young people in the room or in the online audience that this will not be an exercise in nostalgia. Because even though I did come of age uh, at uh, the University of Tennessee in the 1980s, a part of the anti-apartheid coalition of East Tennessee, what I've learned from doing presentations with Dr. Amadou Saul to college classes is that young people consider this ancient history. So your ancient minister promises not to dwell too much on ancient history and I will ensure you that this sermon is not an effort to be retrospective, but to be forward-looking. Apartheid was a policy 
designed to keep people apart, to keep people separate, racial segregation, discrimination, and oppression. However, I want us to reflect on the ways we keep people apart today, the new ways we keep people apart. I want us to reflect on the fundamental spiritual values that are embodied in the life and ministry of Archbishop Desmond Tutu that can guide us today and help us help lead us into the future. Now, when Desmond Tutu was a bishop and later archbishop, he had a reputation for being an agitator for justice and a troublemaker, so much so that a joke uh, circulated to reinforce that point. It was a joke that he helped circulate because he had a great sense of humor and could laugh at himself. The joke went that uh, one day Desmond Tutu died and he went up to heaven and St. Peter sent him straight to hell. And he was in hell for a while and then uh, St. Peter heard this mighty beating on the door of heaven and he opened it up and there was the devil. And he said to the devil, what are you doing here? And he said, well, you sent Bishop Tutu to hell, and he's making so much trouble down there, I decided to come to heaven to ask for political asylum. <laughs> now, when Desmond Tutu told this joke and other jokes, he would laugh also. He would laugh with people. And if you ever heard him interviewed, he has a very distinctive laugh. I once had lunch with his daughter Naomi and it wasn't on purpose it was accident we actually sat down at the same table at a conference and I was talking to somebody else to my left and all of a sudden I heard laughter to my right and I thought that laughter sounds very familiar and I turned around to see someone who looked very much like her father and laughed even more like him now, Maya Angelou once said, you, people will forget what you did, and they will forget what you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And I think that was uh, what I got from Naomi. I don't remember much about what we said to each other. I don't remember much about that conversation, but I know how she made me feel. She made me feel empowered. She made me feel committed. She made me feel inspired, and I think her father had the same effect on people. It wasn't so much what they said or what they did, but how they made you feel. And the, the way that made you, that feeling made, empowered you to do good things. Now, many people know that Desmond Tutu campaigned against apartheid in South Africa, but not everyone knows he also campaigned against homophobia. He once declared, I would refuse to go to a homophobic heaven. Think about that. That's an archbishop speaking. I would refuse to go to a homophobic heaven. That's how powerful I feel about it, he said. Tutu spoke out for the worth and dignity of every person, every single person. And he said if you could convince him that God did not care about the poor, that God did not care about the downtrodden, that God did not care about the despised and the pick, picked upon, that God would not be worthy of our worship. Not worthy of our worship. Tutu wouldn't bow down to any oppressor, human or divine. He would rather do the right thing by the people in his life than do the wrong thing. Do the right thing by people in his life and end up in hell than do the wrong thing by people and end up in heaven. Apartheid in South Africa was not only a political policy, it was a state religion. The Constitution of South Africa used biblical language to, uh, to, to uh, uh, give moral authority to the practices of segregation and economic exploitation. Uh, and this is why Desmond Tutu condemned, condemned apartheid not only like you condemn a political policy, he condemned apartheid as a heresy, a heresy. 
and racism as blasphemy. Desmond Tutu sometimes used uh, humor to point out the hypocrisies of South African religion. He said that when uh, the white man came to Africa, uh, he had the Bible and we had the land. And then he asked us to pray with him. And so we knelt down and we prayed. And when we opened our eyes, we had the Bible and he had the land. Since the Bible had been used to commit such gross injustices, he felt as a religious leader he had a special responsibility to enlist the Bible in support of justice. Archbishop Tutu was heavily influenced by pre-Christian ideas, the ancient African idea that is the opposite of apartheid, Ubuntu. The funda fundamental principle behind Ubuntu is that we human beings are not made for apartness. We are not made for separation. We are made for togetherness. We are interconnected and interdependent. We rise and we fall together. We rise or we fall together. None of us can reach our full potential until everyone has reached their full potential. Well, imagine those fathering words from the meditation earlier, encouraging us all to reach our fullest potential. None of us can be who we were meant to be until every single one of us is who we were meant to be. It is by seeking community that we find ourselves. That's, that's the opposite of a lot of Western European individualism. It's through seeking community that we find ourselves. It is by building the beloved community that we complete ourselves. If a baby is abandoned in the forest, that baby will never learn how to be human unless that baby is taken in by other human beings. We need human beings to become human beings. It is through our relationships to others that we discover ourselves. We need others simply to know who we are. We can't even know ourselves without the help of other people. Now, if you understand this African concept of Ubuntu, then you can recognize similarities found in all the peace-loving religions of the world, that there are similar themes that you can pick up on. And that's one of the reasons why Desmond Tutu formed such good partnerships with people of other faiths. He was inspired by Gandhi, a Hindu who lived in South Africa before him, and was very good friends with the Dalai Lama of Tibet, and there's a great book about their friendship called, do you know what it's called? Joy. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's just uh, these, these themes that crop up in different world traditions. So if you understand Ubuntu, then you know why apartheid is blasphemy and heresy. To abuse another person is to abuse God. To show disrespect for another person is to show disrespect toward God. As Desmond Tutu said, we cannot say we believe in God if we hate each other. This concept of Ubuntu is applicable if you can apply it to your office. You can apply it to your home. You can apply it to your neighborhood. It's a very important spiritual principle that you can apply in your daily life. A political commentator, David Shipler, once applied the concept of Ubuntu to the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And you may not know this, but this church has a, a tradition of hosting the Palestinian uh, uh, Jewish Dialogue Project when, when their attentions are low enough that people are able to meet, encouraging dialogue. So bringing that principle of Ubuntu into, into dialogue. He wrote about the Israeli and Palestinian situation. Whatever happens in war or diplomacy, whatever territory is won or lost, whatever accommodations or compromises are finally made, the future generations 
uh, the future guarantees that Arabs and Jews will remain close neighbors in this weary land, entangled in each other's fears. We'll remain close neighbors. We could say the same thing about Russians and Ukrainians. We could say the same things about any place where two religions or two cultures or two points of view are in conflict with each other, including red states and blue states here in America. To apply this principle of Ubuntu broadly, we must realize we cannot escape each other. We cannot escape each other. We cannot triumph over each other through acrimonious elections or militarily imposed victories. Peace comes when we recognize our interconnectedness, our interrelatedness, our interdependence. Once we realize that we, when we harm another, we harm ourselves. And when we help another, we help ourselves. Today is Juneteenth, and tomorrow we will celebrate, as a nation, official federal holiday of Juneteenth. However, the shooting in a supermarket in Buffalo and the terrorist attack on Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and many other acts of hatred that do not make it into the media, rampant voter suppression and mass incarceration show us that the advocates for apartheid are alive and well and living in the United States of America. As Cornel West once said, the Union won the Civil War, but white supremacy won the peace. So we celebrate the end of slavery today but the work of dismantling racism and white supremacy, that work still continues. A lot of the wealth we see at the, in work in the world today, launching missiles into space, buying Twitter, comes from the mines in South Africa. Comes in the mines of South Africa in those ancient days of history. A lot of that wealth that we see in the world today comes from oppression, both here and abroad. <laughs> this week, our denomination, the Unitarian Universalist Association, will be having our General Assembly. I'm bringing it home. I'm bringing it home. We're having our National General Assembly in Portland, Oregon. Last month, the United Methodist Church, a long-standing church, split in two over culture war issues. And the power of schism is, a, is a present in the Anglican tradition of which Desmond Tutu and my father and my brother and my uncle are all a part of, split in two. This will not happen to our faith, but it will not be because some people aren't trying, because some people are trying. We will have contested elections for leadership of our association at the General Assembly this year, and one of the candidates, Beverly Cease, has actually proposed schism, separation, and apartness. And just so you don't think I'm making it up, let me quote from her website, her campaign website, where she wrote, I acknowledge the desire of many, especially younger and or marginalized identifying members to take our religion in a profoundly new direction, a different direction. I believe this is the wrong approach. I wholeheartedly support helping another branch of Unitarian Universalism to be formed that is more attractive to these aforementioned folks. She goes on, without a hint of irony, she goes on to suggest that this new group be called 21st Century UUs. In other words, she is suggesting that we need a new and separate organization for young people, for people of color, 
for marginalized groups, segregation, apartheid. Now let me be clear. Young people and people of color and marginalized groups are advocating for change in our association. And these leaders can correctly be called 21st century Unitarian Universalists. However, if we separate, if we split into the young and the old, as has happened at Second Pres, you don't have to look too far. If we separate the young and the old and the 21st century you use are young, doesn't that leave white people like me, old people like myself, back in the 20th century? Back in the 20th century. Our young people are attending multiracial, multicultural schools, working in multiracial and multicultural workplaces. How long can a monocultural religious organization survive in the 21st century? Our salvation as a church and as a nation and as a world will never come through apartheid. It will never come through apartness. It will never come through separateness. Our salvation will come through togetherness, connectedness, and interrelatedness. So I propose we move forward together into the 21st century. What do you say? Let's do it. This is my first Father's Day since my father passed away. He was an Episcopal minister, part of the Anglican Communion, and that's the denomination Desmond Tutu is a part of it. And uh, it's the same denomination in a different continent. Now, as a priest, Tutu was called Father Tutu. And he lived long enough to see the end of apartheid in South Africa, and he helped preside over the initial days of healing. It's still, there's still more healing to happen through the truth and reconciliation process. Now, here's the thing. As a minister, uh, he could have easily choos chosen an affluent congregation and an affluent suburb. He could have easily chosen a comfortable existence but he chose otherwise. He chose otherwise. He refused to accept a homophobic heaven. He refused to accept a racist heaven. Now in his last days, when he was on his deathbed, he wrote a letter to his supporters where he said, and these are his words, quote, you would think I, as a person of advanced age, could simply die in peace. But once again, I go out protesting. <laughs> and hopefully, wherever he is now, he is still protesting, still agitating, until the spirit of those words of the Lord's Prayer are fulfilled. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So be it. And love for 
as you prepare to leave this sacred space, uh, pack away a piece of this church in your heart. Wrap it carefully like a precious gem. Carry it with you through the joys and sorrows of your days. Let its gentle glow strengthen you, warm you, remind you of all that is good and true. Until you gather here again in this place of love. Prophetic Church, the world awaits your liberating, agitating, troublemaking ministry. Go forward in the power of love, proclaim the truth that makes us free. But first, as our last act of worship, I invite you to turn and greet your neighbor.